what we're here to talk about. Whatever it says in the slide, Matt. 4DX, a sustainable system for continuous improvement. So Sounds serious. What's the next start the slide say? <laughs> oh, yeah. So we thought before um, we just blether on at you, in fact, that's not what this is really going to be like, is it? Although it says case study, we're really thinking more workshop activity. So be prepared. Yeah. So in fact, we're, we'd like to turn it over to you right now. Um, this is pairs, isn't it, this one? We'd like this to be a pairing activity. Uh, I know it's the last session of the day. Um, everybody's a bit tired, so are we. So uh, if you could just turn to the person that's next to you and spend or, a couple... Or the people, if there's or three, the seven. If you yeah. <laughs> just make a little group near you and think about these two questions. Look at you, you're all in the cult, aren't you? You all know what that means. Sorry, I didn't mean to make it look like a, some sort of Nazi sign. <laughs> um, but anyway, you're, you're all agilists and you know what it means for me to raise my hand so I don't have to make a noise. Good. Um, so why do you have retrospective? Somebody shout out. Why do you do that? Get better. Get better. Learn. Learn. Don't repeat mistakes. Don't repeat mistakes. To stop anything. To stop anything. Stop and think, right, to get in a different frame of mind. Yeah, break out of the day to day. To bond as a team, to bond as a team. yeah. Evolve your process. Say again? Evolve your process. Evolve your process, and there was one over here. Let's give them one. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> we Brits do like doing that, don't they? Yeah. Here's one yeah. here, Matt. Plan and experiment. That's a good one. And what ideas are there in the room for how to track the long-term effect of having the retrospectives? What, what are any of you doing about that? We tend to report the full retrospective. We look back at the problems we identified <coughs> in previous solution, uh, sorry, previous retrospectives. Trying to get everybody to do the thumbs up, thumbs down, right. in the middle to look at whether we really managed to make things better or whether we made it worse or whether we made no impact. So you sort of loop back and check in with things that you'd yeah. intended to do and see whether you have actually done them. Yeah. I usually call it like closing the learning cycle. So like if we actually follow up on the action or we just meet two weeks or a month later and say same shit up yes. That's good. I find uh, yeah, the Periodically, uh, in a significant piece of work, uh, doing timeline exercise to look back and look at how far we've come. So it's still looking at improvements we can make, but we start to look back and think, oh, actually, um, grumbling about this and that, look back then, we were grumbling about X, Y, and Z. Yeah, so you sort of put it in context yeah. of time. Another one? We track the fact do they come back? That's the crucial part for us. They don't appear on the list of the things that we want to action. And it must have changed, yeah. Recurrent. So, should we tell them a bit about why we're here, like who we are? Yeah. I'm here to make creaky noises. Um, so, Sinead, you're a continuous improvement manager, is that right? You've yep. just got a new job title, haven't you? I have a new one, but it has not officially kicked in yet, so we'll, we'll stick with we'll the stick old one. stick with the one, one that I know about. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I work as a sort of agile coach, consultant type person, um, but I also run a small company, or not, not just me, but we, we have a small company. Um, there's about 10 of us, uh, and some of the work that we do is this kind of consulting work. So I was doing some consulting work with Sinead's company, um, and we were working together, and I'd read this book, and I was trying out these ideas within Cucumber, within our organisation, um, and they seemed like a good fit for the problem that we also had at Sinead's company, so we, um, we thought we'd give them a try. So that's what this session's about, is to teach you the ideas from, from the book, give you, give you a sense of what's in the book, um, and tell you some, some of the things that we've learned along the way. We're, we're not pretending to be experts, though, are we? No, I thought we should preface that by saying this has been an experiment for us. Um, Matt tried it out first in his organisation and then based on some of the challenges that we had in Liberty IT, my organisation, we thought 
some of the same, um, the methodology might work to solve some of the problems that we had as well. Um, it has been pretty experimental. It's been running as a pilot for the last couple of months, so we're definitely not experts, but we're learning a lot from going through the process. A couple of months isn't doing it justice. When did we start? May? May time. Yeah. Over the yeah. summer. Okay. So what we're trying to get out of this session, um, the learning outcomes that we would like you guys to take away, or to phrase it another way, Matt and my wildly important goals from this session, is that you guys on leaving the session are going to be able to name the four disciplines that make up 4DX, or the four disciplines of execution, and also come away with an understanding around the difference between a lead and a lag measure. Um, so we've spent quite a bit of time working with teams around what a lag measure is, what a lead measure is, um, which one's more difficult to capture, executives and organizations were used to sort of looking at the lag measure. Really what we want to do is get into the more predictive view of things and, and take a look at the lead measures, but it is much more difficult. Um, so that's what we're hoping, that at the end of the session, you guys will walk away with that from a learning perspective. Right, and so there's a big, big principle, big point to make behind this, right? Because um, a lot of people do goals wrong, um, and they make this point really well in the book, uh, but this would be the, w the way to screw this up if you wanted to butcher it and make a mess um, is you would impose these on teams, right? You'd set targets for them. That would be the way to make it all go wrong and not work. It's really important. That's a, a, just a, a good sort of baseline for you to think about for the, for the whole uh, conversation that we're going to have is remember that this is all going to be by the team for the team. The team is setting their own goals, figuring out what they need to do. This was one of the big selling points of introducing this methodology into our organization. As Matt says, you know, we've all been through situations before where things have been enforced top down. <laughs> to try, get the teams to try this approach from us, um, we actually wanted them to opt in. So put your hand up if you want to participate in this and take part in the pilot. And that was the approach that we used for the team. We told them it was by the team, for the team. We weren't going to share any of the data. It was up to them to share their goals, share their trends if they wished. Um, so it's a principle that we had buy-in from our executive team. So the executive team in Liberty IT were very much behind the, what we were trying to achieve. Um, but they recognized that they did not have any veto rights on what the team goals were, what the measures were. Um, their role really in the whole process was just to support it and understand it. Yeah, and so that's maybe the contrast that's important to make between what we've done at Liberty IT and what we've done at Cucumber because um, we've used 4DX at Liberty IT for, con for continuous improvement. It's, it's for tracking changes teams are making to their world to help them get better at what they're doing. Um, what we've tried to do at Cucumber is we've tried to use it more for strategy. So. Um, again, individual sort of bits of the organization that are responsible for sales or product development um, are trying to think about what are the, what's the main thing they're trying to achieve at the moment and how would you measure that and then we can see how those things align. So we're trying to experiment with this more as a, as a tool, tool for strategy management on that small scale. Right, so the first discipline. Focus on the wildly important. And what the book is trying to get from this is there are lots of things that we could change. If you think about your own team, your own organization, you've probably got a laundry list of things that you would like to change or make improvements to. What we're asking teams to do and what we spend a lot of time coaching our teams in doing is really focus and distill it down to one or two key things that they want to improve. So think on this question for yourself. What happens when you do try to change a lot of things at once? And again, if every other area of your operation or organization remained the same, what is the one area where you could make a change that would have the most impact? And these are the questions that we pose to our teams to help them really focus on what it is we're trying to get from this first discipline. 
So just meditate on that for yourself for a minute. Think about your team or a team that you're coaching, all the various areas that they work in, the things that they do, the things that they struggle with. Which of those do you think could have the biggest impact if you could shift, shift it? Just think about that for a minute. Has everybody thought of something? We're going to come back to this later in the session, so I would advise you to have a good, a good noodle on it. So that's discipline one. Focus on the wildly important. And remember that, because we, we only pass this workshop if you remember all four of these, so that's the first one. You might want to write it down. Um, so uh, they, they talk about, it's quite, you know, we like these templates, don't we, um, when we're learning new things. Um, this is quite a useful template for structuring the expression of a goal. So try, um, I'm going to try and change something like, um, well, a good example is, is, is weight loss, right? A few years ago, I wanted to lose a bit of weight. Um, I weighed about uh, 80 kilos. I wanted to weigh 75. Um, I didn't know about this framework at that time, but I decided to myself, I want to change my weight from 80 to 75 kilos. I don't think I set myself a date either. I just got on and did it. But that would be your, your sort of general <laughs> template for thinking about this. You want to be really concrete. What is the thing that's going to change? What is it now? And what would I like it to be? And when do I think I'll be able to get there? So there's quite a lot packed up in that, right? You need to have decided what it is that you want to change from all of those different things that are available to you that might make a difference. And you also need to know where you're at right now. You need to know what X is. So this isn't something that you can just do in a 30 seconds of meditation in a, in a workshop no. like this. And from our experiences, what we found is this is where the teams get stuck at the very beginning. So we're not very good at setting goals, right? We've, I'm sure we've all been and uh, participated in poor goal setting sessions. The other thing that the teams really struggle with is from X. Sometimes they don't even know what X is. They know what the goal is. They have no idea what their baseline measure looks like in order to try and improve that. So usually the first thing that teams have to do is go away and start to gather some initial data just to get a baseline of what X is. Yeah, and that might be for f four or five, six different things that you think you might want to change. It's useful to measure all of them just to see where you're at. Yep. All right, so discipline two. Discipline two, act on the lead measures. This is the hardest discipline of the lot. Based on what I'd said earlier, um, we're all very used to determining what a lag measure is. So the example that Matt used around weight um, it's very easy to say, you know, I want to go from 10 stone to 9 stone by Christmas. Um, I get on the scale today and I get on the scale at Christmas and that tells me what my weight is and that's my, my lag measure. But It's too late. It's too it's late. It's too late. You can't do anything about it. It's already happened. So what are the lead measures then that I need to be looking at as I go through the time period from now to Christmas that's actually going to tell me am I going to hit my goal? when I get on those scales on Christmas. Go on, over to you. What could we do? Number of calories consumed. Number of calories consumed. Great. Daily activity. Daily activity. So amount of exercise, number of hours of exercise or whatever. Weighing yourself daily. Well, so weighing yourself daily would give you uh, more high fidelity feedback about the effect, but it's still not a lead indicator. It's still telling you what has happened. Pardon? It can show you your trend, yes. It, the, the, the distinction that's important to make is that it's still a lagging indicator. It's still, you can't do anything about that weight by itself. It's not under your control. <laughs> What's under your control is how many hours of exercise you do or how many calories you put into your body. 
right? And so the, obviously the thing that you want to change, the outcome is, is the thing that you see on the scales. And yeah, if you want to do it every day and get really high fidelity, you do it, do it every, uh, do it every you know, half a day even, get really high fidelity data, that's great. Um, but it's still on its own, it's not, gonna, it's not under your control. Yeah. I get where you're going, but it's a really bad example because the point is not all calories are created equal, it's the nature of the food, right. lots of different sure. stuff. So if what gets measured gets done and that's what we measure, then you have yeah. to pick two really bad measures for a long term. Yeah. So I get the point. Yeah. So we're, we're, so yeah. I mean, we could, we could talk about that. There's a whole deeper conversation to have about goals and how healthy it is to focus on just one thing and what's going to be the impact on all the other things that you're doing. Um, so this is kind of with the assumption that you're going to be thinking about all of that stuff too. And, and we, but we are talking about, in the end, about changing habits, changing behaviours. So actually the effect for me, right, when I did do that, I, I, I went on diet for the first time in my life because my mate was faster at fell running than me and I was jealous. And I got lighter and I've stayed lighter because it changed my eating habits. It did. Like learning to reflect on what I was eating changed, changed my habits. So, you know, some of that, having the feedback about the behaviour itself, the predictive stuff, it helps you have the effect that you're, that you're looking to have in the end. But yeah, you've got to be careful. Okay. So, yeah, just to sort of sum that point up, that if you want to try and tell the difference between a lead and a lag measure, that's the thing to think about. Can you control it? So we've got a thing for them to do, haven't we? We do. So there's a bit of paper that was on your chairs? Our scenarios? Yeah. Ten minutes? Mm, five. Five? Don't you tell them less. Tell them three or four minutes. Okay. So you should have a handout with some scenarios on it. And what we'd like you to do is, either in your pairs or as a group activity, take a look through the scenarios that are listed there and take a look at the measures and just see if you can identify which are lead measures, which are lag measures. Take about four or five minutes on that and then we'll do a bit of a debrief. Who wants to tell me about a puzzle they had trying to do these lead and lag measures? What was, uh, which, where's one that was confusing? That's all right. <laughs> you just voluntold someone. Yeah. Yeah. It's a coaching stance. <laughs> yeah, um, you can make quite a lot of arguments for both, I think, sometimes. So. Where's, what's a specific example of that? Um, so the sales funnel one we got really confused with. Because number of hits on a training web page felt like a result you couldn't control and then we thought well you could invest more money in it and then it could well you could just go and like keep refreshing the page <laughs> couldn't you yourself <laughs> that would be one way to do it i suppose yeah so it's how strictly is that really the definition of you have no control over this or you Effectively, yeah. And I suppose also it's like you, there's Pandora's boxes here of things, yeah. aren't there? So something that, that you could look at as a lead measure. Actually, there's probably lead measures behind that even, aren't there? Yeah, of course. Um, so do you want to explain the thing about the system? I'll let you explain that. <laughs> <laughs> I need to use my hands because we didn't have a, a slide. He wanted, the, the, what, he wanted to draw you a diagram. The way we think slide. about it, yeah, yeah, go on. The way we think about it is like, uh, you know, here's your, your team or your organisation or whatever is this, is this complicated system, complex system of human interactions. Um, and there are things that you do every day that affect the system and then there are outcomes, right? So maybe the outcome is that you have a code base that's gradually rotting and getting harder and harder to work on. That's one of the outcomes. And or you have a training sales uh, pipeline that's stagnating and it's not getting any more calls through than it did last month, right? That's, that's the outcome. So what are the inputs, what are the things that go into the system that's, that have some kind of an effect on the outcome? And what you're doing really with the, uh, your lead measures you're, is you're hypothesizing, you're thinking, well, what might affect the number of people that, that visit our website? 
what could we do that might affect the number of people that visit our website? And so, for me, visit, uh, visit the visitors to the website is definitely a lagging measure because it's, it's you I mean, unless you actually like went out and paid people to go and visit the website or did it all yourself, you can't directly affect it. But you can do things that that probably will, like running experiments to change the copy or. Um, running ads or whatever and you can think about what those things and that those are the inputs to your system and really what you're trying to do here is model some get some information about what that system is and how you can affect it end of rant did anyone else have another puzzle Brian yes I was an effort yeah it works <laughs> yeah I think we sort of boil it down to inputs versus outputs. So inputs being that which you can control and outputs that you can't. So when we were looking at like the technical debt one, um, there was score. And it's kind of like a football score, you know, the ball's already in the net, it's too late. But there was a bit of discussion around number of commits with refactoring the title. Because on one hand that's something we can say, you know, is, is that something that we can control or is that something well actually it's a number of stories have dri driven that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, bit, That's the thing about physical. the Pandora's box, because, you know, ideally, the, the number of refactoring commits in a sprint is something that you can control, right? Like, the team of, are empowered and they can decide and... But the, the fact that you're looking at the number of commits, it sounds like it's past tense, thus... It's, right. You're looking, well, we've committed 10 times this week, that's great, we can't change that now. That was 10 times this I week. I see what you mean. Yeah. That's why yeah. it was a bit fuzzy. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. So realistically, though, what, like when you're actually doing this, practicing this week in, week out, that is what you'll be doing. So you'll be, you'll be looking back at the week and going, how did we get on with our scores this week? What did we do? Um, yeah, I mean, you could do it every day if you wanted. And you could set, try and set yourself a target, like we're going to try and do 10 refactoring commits every day. But you still need a feedback loop where you go, how many do we actually do? Yeah, I see that. Though. So you mentioned that as well, didn't you, about the past tense? Yeah. Can we have the caps box, Ryan, just so we can hear this, dude? Yeah. I can have just one. I mean, so some of these uh, can can be interpreted both leading and lagging. I mean, I'm looking at this the the number of days this week that we did to our agreed structured day. Now you could look at that as something that we try and control to implement something. Yeah. But it's also the consequence of another input because if shit happens, we're not going to be able yeah. to adhere yeah. to policy. So it's yeah. both an input and an output. Yeah. yeah. And that's what we see when we're working with the teams. You know, that's, it's the same types of conversations that we're having with them. There's quite a nice uh, phrase that they use in the 4DX book called the whirlwind. They talk about your whirlwind, and you're, you're trying to do these continuous improvement activities despite your whirlwind. So there are always going to be loads of other things going on. And this is, this is a way, or it, it, and it is almost about developing self-discipline, isn't it? Yep. As we've seen it in teams, about just holding on to the things that you know really matter and making the time to do them. But it might also raise out some of the things like uh, Luke talked this morning about the soup. You know, like the things that sit around the team that prevent the team from actually doing what they need to be doing. And we've certainly seen that in some of the workshops that we've run where, <laughs> you know, the team list out all of the, the things that they'd like to improve on and many of them are outside of their control. They're not actually things that they can fix themselves. So it can be a useful way to get that kind of conversation happening as well, but that's sort of a different thing, isn't it? Yep. Right, discipline three. So discipline three is around keeping a compelling scoreboard. <laughs> now, whether we look at these scoreboards or not and define them as compelling, that's almost irrelevant. This is what the teams, some of the teams in Liberty IT have put together as their compelling scoreboards. Um, not going to go into them in too much detail, but some of them you see are pretty low fidelity, just sort of tables on a wiki page. Um, you've got a, a whiteboard there, um, or you've got the teams that are a bit, little bit more high fidelity. They've got Atlas board plugged into Jira, Bamboo, Jenkins, they're pulling all their um, numbers, putting them into a dashboard. But the key thing about it all is that it's visible. Again, it's done by the team, for the team. They're up in the team areas. They're talking about it every day. And they use it then as an input to discipline four. Discipline four. 
So remember, discipline three was keep a compelling scoreboard. Don't forget that, because you're going to need to remember those four to walk out of the room. Um, so discipline four is the hardest one, isn't it? The other three so. are hard, but I think this is the hardest one. Yep. And it's the most important one. Um, I, I almost think before you answer this question, I, it might be worth just pondering for a minute on what does accountability mean to you? <coughs> right. Yeah, that's what, some people, that's what some people think, isn't it? I mean, not just people who are... Uh, but people who are holding other people to account think that ac account means blame. Does accountability need to mean blame? It could just mean that you know whose job something is. It's not a vague task that floats around that I think he's doing it, he's, she's doing it. There's a really good blog post about this on um, Etsy's engineering blog about uh, they have a they have like one of their sort of six or whatever guiding principles of their development team is that they are a blame free organization and they talk about in this in this blog post about a production outage and how they went through the process of of uh, investigating and, and and learning from that production outage and how their blame free culture helped and how their culture of accountability helped because there was one person who was accountable for the uptime of that system and that person was able to go off and find out the information and help the whole organisation learn from what had happened and tell everybody about it so that it would be less likely to happen again. But nobody ever pointed the finger at that person, nobody ever you know, um, told them that they'd done a bad job or um, undermined them. So accountability does not have to mean blame. But it does mean being clear about what you're going to do and then doing your best to do it and being able to tell other people either how it went when you did it or why you weren't able to. So talk about this in your groups, in your little group that's next to you. What happens at the moment if you do retrospectives and you have actions that come out of them or whatever, how do you how do you keep one another in check? Somebody already mentioned that they had a, a review cadence. It was, it was you, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, so that was, that was one, one thought. But have a, have a little talk in your group. How do you do this at the moment? Do you do this at the moment? So well behaved. You're probably out of talk pretty much, aren't you, by this point of the conference? Yeah. It's quite easy to get them to stop. They're very well behaved. So you have had a wee bit of time to talk over a couple of these questions. Um, how does your team currently hold one another to account? What's the impact whenever you don't do it? And how does it feel whenever you do have to hold someone to account? Or indeed, you're on the receiving end of being held to account? Seb? What does it mean to be held to account? What does it mean for you, Seb? What happens in your group? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, basically, though, for me, being held to account is when you take responsibility for something. So, it's not so much you're being held. It's not so much you're being held to account. It's that because you've taken on responsibility for some, something, you feel the need to um, either get it done or be able to explain how it's going to get done or why you're not going to be able to get it done and needs to move on. Yeah. So, it's, it's just the verb. Being held to account feels quite. Like it's being done to you, being violent. done to you, yeah, yeah. It's a good point, yeah. I, I, I almost think about it as like being able to give an account, like being able to tell the story. Good catch, sir. That's all right. Well, um, I guess like some of the questions here: how do, how do you feel? How does someone else feel? Uh, one of the things we we try and encourage one of our values is a one team, so we kind of depersonalise accountability. You know, if, if there's been a, a failure of process or a failure of communication, maybe that's the reason behind why an individual didn't get something done in time. We, yeah. we kind of try and take away that sort of personalising if something's not been done, because that, that can maybe, you know, it can create kind of awkwardness yeah. in the situation. And the reason this has proven to be quite difficult in our organisation is that we're not very good at it. 
Um, and what we have seen with the teams that we have piloted this with is that they're not very good at it. And when we come back and we're doing our coaching conversations or we're checking in with the teams again, it can be very hit and miss whether the teams have actually made progress or not. Um, and sometimes it's because they almost don't want to, they may have signed up and said, that's my action and that's what I'm going to do to progress these things. Um, and th but then when that doesn't happen for whatever reason, they're just not that comfortable explaining it or talking about it. Um, so what we've learned from our organization is that this has been one of the most um, difficult disciplines to, to get the teams involved in. Let's get back. Um, the term accounting uh, is, uh, you know, it's a balancing of the books. It's a, it's a numeracy. It's a numering. It's, a, it's about money and numbers. Um, why maybe you would want to create a cadence of understanding. Yeah, that's a better word. As opposed isn't it? to accounting. Because yeah. when things go wrong, they can't be accounted for. That's the whole freaking point. The numbers aren't right. Yeah. Right? So what you want is a moment of understanding, not of accounting. And it also allows us to have you know, blameless retrospectives and blame yeah. free areas. So the question is, can we come to understand, not can we account for? Yeah, yeah. Accounting is an explanatory. It doesn't help us. Yeah, because you, you hear that word as money, and I do think about it as like telling the story, like giving the account. That, so a philosophical um, account, is, again, yes, but I, I still would say that that's a very logic-based thing. It's not yeah. a, I, I just think understanding is softer. Yeah, I don't yeah. Know. well, it's, it's, it, it, it better expresses what the, the meaning I see. I agree. In that word. Yeah, yeah that's what I was hoping. You, you're right, there's an ambiguity there. I hadn't thought about it as being money, but yeah. you're right. Yeah. And actually, some of, the, some of the terminology that they use in the book, uh, even whenever we've introduced it to our teams, I mean, the scoreboard is another example. Our teams are not comfortable with that term. And, you know, now, the reason that it is designed to use that language is it's the, it's the concept of competition and, you know, right. encouraging that type of behavior. But our teams, are saying, I don't like that. Is it, should it be a competition? Can we not call it something else? So what probably we're going to do going forward is we're going to take it, we're going to tweak some of the words yeah, just perfect. to make it a bit more meaningful and more uh, something that will resonate better with our team. I kind of like scoreboard because it's like a game. Isn't it? mm. yeah. 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 I like games. But. So you, made, you set these goals at the start as a team. Or so, does it ha so, does it, so you make these goals at the start as a team. Yeah. So does it happen then when you have these moments of understanding that they somehow they don't feel they actually own those goals? So what we generally see is that what's happened is we've had them in a room talking about where would they like to be. Then we've talked to them about what would they, do they think they need to do in order to get there. And then we've talked to them about, OK, so what are we going to do in this next like, couple of weeks to help us get better at doing those things so we can get there? And then we see them in a couple of weeks, and they kind of go, well, we did a couple of them. I'm just looking at Bernie, because we did this last week. Oh, I kind of did this one, but um, haven't had any time. Or, or they'll say, like, we're going to do all these things. We have got a release next week, but we're going to do all these things. Because they really want to do it, because they're enthused, right? Because this is their goal. They, they own it. It's going to make their lives better. Um, but then they have to do a release. And then you see them in two weeks, and they're like, oh, I didn't do any of them. Um, and like, I think that's interesting. That's, that creates understanding, because that helps them to learn about setting their right expectations about what they're actually going to be able to do in the next two weeks if they've got to do a release, or how releases are getting in the way of them ever being able to create a better system for them to operate in week to week. So, does that answer your question? I yes. Can't. Yeah. It's sort of being and honest you, with and yourselves. And then you do you follow up with them again on yeah. one to ones? Like yeah. this is. Do this we does set, require a lot of co a lot of coaching. What, why why this is helpful for them, basically? Yeah. 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 <laughs> this is. The, but the irony that we, of it is that, you know, the team have set their own goals. They've recognised it's something that's going to improve their capacity to, to meet the organisation's expectations of them. It's going to improve their working lives. And yet, um, some, for some of them, it becomes, still becomes very difficult for them to find the self-discipline to make time for those activities in and around their whirlwind. So this, this cadence becomes very important, either for 
coaches or managers or whatever you want to call them to sort of help recognise where there are those teams that need a bit more shielding and protection or just to help the teams develop that resilience for themselves that they will look after themselves. It's about looking after yourself, you know, eating healthily or, what, or whatever. So, yeah, that's what it's about. Yep. You can take one more question. Lost the catch box. Mm -hmm. Oh, two more, Matt, sorry. Oh, sorry, where? Is that the right one? Yep. yep. Well, I go first. I don't know. Um, I don't know whether it help anybody else. I know that one thing I've found is we're talking about cadence, and we've talked about the fact that we use the retrospective often to surface out what the improvement activities are going to be. Usually, as a scrum master, I would approach that with the team as getting them to make the commitment to the improvements as part of the sprint planning, so that you know you can then talk about the capacity. As you say, you might end up with a sprint where people are saying, "Well, we can't do all that." and do these improvement activities at the same time. Um, and, and, you know, we talked about the semantics around accountability and, you know, and, and it, there's obvious, obviously arguments around the word commitment these days. It's almost becoming a little bit of a, a bad word to use. But just kind of getting that buy-in from the team and also the visibility and in the same way that a team member might be essentially making themselves accountable to deliver a feature, they can make themselves or whether individually or as part of a small group, accountable for delivering some kind of improvement. And I've definitely found that that, that helps and uh, kind of demystifies it and kind of gets people a little bit more... And you're getting in. it out on the table then as well. And it just, like, these things are just as important as the other things that we're doing. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. It's not some secret thing that we do when we get a bit of spare time. Lady beside Seb. I don't want to throw while you're writing in case I hit you in the side of the head. <laughs> no, I was just, yeah, Oh, I didn't have my hand up anymore. <laughs> you just hold the cat's box. We've got one more one from more. Carl. So just building on the kind of debate around the word accountability, I was kind of thinking of it as a cadence of learning. Given that we want to do continuous improvement, we, we need to learn about what to do there. Yeah. And learning requires understanding. Good point. Thank you, Carl. We said we didn't have all the answers, didn't we? And look at that. That's why we're here. Out of the room. Yeah. So, so yeah. The, we've, we've got time to play with it. Ten minutes left. Yeah. yeah. You've got another handout beside you. It's this one with the little <laughs> Venn diagram. So this is not a test, but this is where hopefully uh, you'll be able to demonstrate that you've taken in the learning outcomes that we're expecting from this session. Um, what we'd ask you to do is, in LIT, we have a set of organizational uh, expectations that are around the three dimensions in this Venn diagram. So when you join the organization, there are expectations around autonomy, expectations around technical excellence, and expectations around delivering value. So when we've been working with our teams uh, using this methodology, typically the goals that they're coming up with are re somehow related to these uh, set of organizational expectations. So what we'd ask you to do again in your groups for the next few minutes is have a think about um, your own goal that you might want to improve using the three dimensions on this sheet. Now, you don't have to. If you've got something else that sits outside these three, that's okay. Yeah, or even a personal one. Even a personal one. Yeah. But it'll just give you an idea of how we've been doing the workshop in our organization. So just take a couple of minutes to do that now. Right, you have not had a long time there to think about your deep, uh, have, to have, have great depth to think about your wildly important goals. Um, but do your best now. Take that index card that I gave you at the beginning, the big red one. Just try and write down now something um, that you want to try and achieve based on being in this session. Is it going to be some action that you're going to take when you go back to your team? Is it um, a big goal that you've thought of, either for yourself or for your team? What's your, what's your action that you're going to take away from this session? Write it on that index card, please, on one side. Did you do one? Oh, Bernie's already written on hers. Okay. 
for facilitation, I think give you clear direction about when to use index card. The list is long. No, you can write it however you like. Good question. Excellent timekeeping. Do you want time to do the email address? And you get it done. I've been talking too much. Yeah. Have you all had a chance to write your goal on one side of the card? On the other side of the card, we'd ask you to uh, write your partner's email address. Mm -hmm. The person. <laughs> the person you've been working with. When we say partner there. <laughs> your pair partner. Yeah. The person you've been, you've been uh, mostly talking to through this session. Get their email address right on the back of the card. And then email them. And then you're going to email them. Yep. Uh, talk a bit about accountability. Yep. That's, uh, we're going to email them in a, and then, a few weeks and tell them how it went. In a couple of weeks' time, we'd ask you to email the person who, whose address you've got and give them an update on how you've got on with achieving your goal. How long? A couple of you, weeks. You discuss you it between you. It might take you longer, mightn't it? It depends on what your goal is. Right. That's it. We're done. So we just want to say thanks. Thanks for being here. We actually thought we were going to have about three people left in this room when we saw we got the Friday afternoon slot. So thanks for sticking with it and uh, coming here and sticking with us. I hope you've got something out of the session. Um, we certainly have. So yeah, thank you very much. Thanks.